So our graphic designer chose this photo. I didn't really pay attention to it until I was getting ready for this presentation today. Does anybody know what that's a photo of? Tree. Yes? <laughs> anybody know what particular tree it is? So it's, it's, uh, it's actually the, it's called the Angel Oak. It's, uh, we have a house, my family has a house now down outside Charleston. And if you're ever down in Charleston, South Carolina, um, strongly recommend you take the time, it's about 30 minutes outside of Charleston, where the Angel Oaks grows. It's believed to be close to 450 years old. It's uh, one of the oldest uh, trees on the East Coast. Um, and it looks just like this. It's magnificent. It's giant. It's like a, a football field in size. And it's still accessible, though they're talking about building a perimeter so that you can't go close to it. But right now, you can actually walk right up and give it a hug if you choose to. So um, it seemed particularly apt, given the conversation about longevity that we're going to have today. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes and try to unpack uh, a couple of topics. Um, one will be why we're doing this thing called Juve Life, which is our Nutrapharma uh, division of Juvenescence, and explain a little bit about the, the rationale behind it. It is, uh, uh, I guess one could say it's almost like a contraindication in a company that's heart and soul really is in therapeutics. Um, but we're very excited about the potential of what we're doing in this area. Uh, we are going to talk about synthetic biology. Um, it's probably not the best name for this area, to be honest. Um, it's certainly not a consumer-friendly name for this area. Uh, but it is a very exciting technology. And we believe it's going to be a game-changing technology uh, across our division. Um, I, I should be careful. I will, will point out right now that Dr. Patrick Cohane is in the back here, and uh, I'll, I'll point out Patrick in just a couple minutes. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Patrick is a, a true colleague um, and is our chief medical officer for um, our, our partner company, um, Chrysia, which we, uh, we founded in and we invested in uh, several years ago. And um, we'll talk a lot, but they're really the driver of a lot of the work that we're doing in the synthetic biology area as we speak. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the first compound that Patrick and I and a few others are deeply focused on, um, which is uh, a very, very exciting nutritional uh, bioactive that we think can make a huge difference in terms of pre prevention and uh, improvement of healthy aging. So with that, um, let me just give you a couple more points about my, my background. You'll see in my bio, um, I started my career at Johnson & Johnson in 1991. I came up through the Consumer Health Division of J&J, &J, which was called McNeil Consumer, although J&J is rebranding, as you may know, as we speak. So um, it's a very different company than when I was there for the 15 years back at that time. Um, as I came up through the brand management side of the business, I took over as worldwide president of the nutritional business, launched Splenda Worldwide, which became a $650 million business for J&J. &J during that time and then moved over to run the OTC division McNeil um, on a worldwide basis, which was a $3.5 billion uh, division of J&J &J when I was leading it. Uh, I left J&J, &J, worked in a variety of different companies, including at Walgreens pre-boots, um, and I was the chief innovation officer. I led uh, innovation and healthcare at Weight Watchers, and most recently before Juvenescence, before meeting um, Jim and Greg and Declan, um, I was the CEO of the Vitamin Shop, which is the second largest and broad scale retailer of supplements in the United States. Um, I apologize for the American spelling and the American accent. I know it's a horrible violation, particularly at Oxford, to be putting these slides up. Um, so I'm sure everybody will point them out. And I know Jim Mellon will give me notes at the end of the presentation of where I misspelled quite a few areas. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to get the points across about why we're very excited about this division and how it fits in synergistically with where we're going in the future of, of, uh, of, of juvenescence. So let's see if I can get the pointer to work. This way? There we go. So let's start with an investment case, because I know many of you are investors, and you always like to see a good investment thesis when we start a conversation. So what is Nutrapharma, and what's the investment case behind Nutrapharma? So first of all, I believe we should have a TM, and Jim's name should be at the end of that, because he was the one who coined Nutrapharma about a year and a half ago when we kept calling it consumer this, consumer that. And he said, well, really, it's, it's really about harnessing the power of nature and nutrition, but using a pharma-like approach to it. 
Um, my regulatory friends don't particularly like the pharma name as close to Nutri as it's shown here, but it's actually quite apropos of the way we run this division. Um, this division is really run as a science-driven, clinically-driven division, but we happen to pick candidates that are already available in nature but are difficult at times to harvest or to pull through, and all of them have a fairly significant IP suite. That's one of the fundamental reasons why we will pick a compound to start to work on and bringing it forward. Um, you'll see in some of the literature that we gave you about juvenescence, one of the things about juvenescence is we fundamentally tend to jibe against the concept of the traditional healthcare sick treat paradigm. Um, particularly when you're talking about uh, longevity, it's hard to think in sick treat terms. If you think solely about diseases and trying to treat diseases, which as you heard from Steve, is a lot of the way we have to think about the targets that we're going after for drugs, you also miss what's happening actually with the body biologically. And fundamentally, we believe strongly that not only is there space for where it's appropriate sick treat, but there's a huge space for prevention. And a lot of the products in our portfolio for Juve Life are really focused more on that prevention paradigm. Um, it is also all based on, on nutrition. At the end of the day, it's the power of nutrition that we highlight. Um, I, I introduced myself to Dr. Khan earlier today. Um, we're, we're fellow Pepsiites from back in the day and um, both very, very strong believers in the power of wellness. Um, longevity, frankly, just looks at wellness towards the later years. Um, and I think that there's opportunities for some of the products that we're developing to be started to be used as early as his 20s. In fact, one of our compounds potentially could have a role in infant formula. Um, but they're particularly powerful as you get into the aging years. Um, Jim noted the rapid regulatory pathway. So in the US, that's called GRASS, generally recognized as safe. In Europe, it would go through an EFSA novel foods pathway. Um, either of these pathways basically put a significant burden on making sure that there's very strong safety toxicity work that's done to demonstrate that there's no harm that can be done by the compounds. They require a level of efficacy understanding. We tend to take our level of that understanding by twofold, threefold before we go to market because we want to be confident that our compounds are bioavailable. We want to be confident that they are getting through to the target. And then our intention once introduced is continue clinical work. And in fact, as we talked about with the, uh, the metabolic switch product, which I won't be talking about too much because Steve already got a chance to talk about it, but our ketone ester product, which you have a sample of in your, in your bag, um, is actually about to get uh, into a large Department of Defense study in the United States, a $10 million grant for three years, focused on a variety of different endpoints that might not necessarily have been exact endpoints that we would have gone after at Juvenescence, but actually one of our lead scientists is going to be one of the contributing scientists to that study. And that's an example of continuing to drive this science-driven, evidence-based, proprietary product approach that we have in the area. Our other goal is to make sure that these are accessible and affordable. So typically our, our goal is to try to get the dosage down to about a dollar a day, about a pound a day worth of, of value. That just happens to coincide, I guess, this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but ultimately our goal is to get to a fairly broad addressable market. These will not be dirt cheap. These will not be vitamin A, vitamin C types of, 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 of targets. Um, but these will not also be ridiculously premium where they can only be used by the ultra rich and by a tiny niche. These will be broadly available. And increasingly we're seeing opportunities not only for developing our own brands, but also to move into market on a branded ingredient basis. So we develop the compound, we get the science behind it, we scale up the manufacturing behind it, but then we make it accessible to partners, folks like Nestle or Unilever or Reckitt or others that might be interested in using these compounds in their products as they bring to market. Um, anybody who's worked in the food industry, anybody who's worked in the supplement industry, knows that one of the dirty secrets of the market in those areas is there's very little actual novel innovation. There's a lot of me too churning of compounds in this area and we are gonna be one of those companies that's actually gonna go upstream a bit further to make sure that we're working on things that are truly novel and that will make impact. And we know there's a strong market for that both on a B2C directly to consumer and a B2B as, a, as an ingredient to serve through other people's business. 
Um, as I mentioned, at our discovery phase, when we're making choices on partners or compounds we're going to make a bet on, including the one I'll talk about extensively today, we're looking at the um, IP strategy and the IP uh, state that's built around that compound. We're typically then contributing to that. I have a couple of colleagues from our legal department here in the, uh, in the audience today who I know work feverishly to help us to make sure that we've got, frankly, pharma-like IP around natural compounds, either on, um, on matter or on, on methodology, to be able to help us to protect these. So having worked on this side of the equation of the traditional supplement market for a large part of my career, one of the frustrations is while there are some very good supplements in the world that are available, there are also a lot of very poor supplements in the world. And this market is characterized by a lot of extracts, minerals, vitamins, not that many, frankly, specifically targeted towards aging. Usually they're more general purpose targeting. The efficacy data is frankly usually very poor, um, usually relying on large epidemi epidemiological studies, not specific to a specific compound, very poor traceability. Um, most of the product form and packaging is kind of weak. It tends to be white bottle, white pills sold through the market and very little personalization, which is a, a real problem, particularly in a consumer market today, which is frankly being driven by, by personalization more than any other factor. As we develop our Juve Life portfolio and our pipeline, we're looking at proprietary novel bioactives, scientifically validated, clinically proven. We are optimizing the manufacturing supply chain. We are not in the business of being our own manufacturer but we are taking early bets and working in uh, proprietary relationships to be able to work the development of these compounds and then ultimately award them in a contract manufacturing exclusive basis to make sure we can make them at the right price points. We're optimizing these compounds for user experience and one of the big things you'll hear us talk about quite a bit is about the feedback loop to the consumer. So how do, how do I know as a consumer that when I take this supplement or when I take this particular Nutrapharma product, it's really working for me. I need some way to be able to measure that. And so what we try to make sure on every one of our compounds is that there's an easy and readily available diagnostic for the consumer so that they can actually tell that it is bioavailable and it is making a difference in their lives as they move forward. And we're developing many of those biomarker markers as we're developing the product as well. So when we think about the differentiation for our division, it's really based on manifesting the strong juvenescence belief that is product consumer centric, really making sure that the, the, our, our patient is in the middle of, of everything. We've got some really outstanding scientific partnerships um, and that's helped by the fact that juvenescence has a reputation in the market as being a real scientific leader. So we have sort of a moth to the flame type of situation that happens where people seek us out for partnerships moving forward. Um, it allows us to rapidly introduce safe and efficacious natural compounds, but I do want to point out at the bottom, they're interrogated by an extremely good expert team. And, you know, yes, that means that sometimes we drag Dr. Felstead into conversations that he takes his pharma background and he interrogates a natural compound, and then we find the right balance point for, for developing the clinical uh, design to bring these to market. But, but fundamentally, we've developed, I think, a very strong cross-functional team to be able to make sure that this um, portfolio is well-developed and then rapidly brought to market. So that's Juve Life, and that's the Nutrapharma sector. I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about synthetic biology. Um, I can't claim to be an expert, per se, in synthetic biology, but I've been learning a lot, particularly from our colleagues at Chrysia. Um, uh, it is a extraordinarily fast-growing technology, as Jim pointed out. It is impacting multiple sectors. But what's particularly interesting is if you were to sort of custom design a technology for this whole Nutrapharma sector, you would probably seek out something like synthetic biology. And you'll understand why in a couple of slides that this is the case. Um, it has been the technology that has enabled major progress in antibiotics, in malaria treatments, typically in any area where the compound itself is difficult to either chemically synthesize or extract. Um, this is where synthetic biology becomes 
um, quite useful. Um, there have been two complementary technologies that have really revolutionized this sector. So one has been the CRISPR technology, so genetic sequencing, um, because fundamentally this is based on a fermentation uh, approach, so you're, um, you're, you're doing CRISPR technology against yeast or other um, biologic fermenters that are able to create the product, and also machine learning, so as we pick um, a, a target area, um, the, the AI allows us to rapidly, in silico, determine what are the best methodology, the likely approaches for the genetic sequencing that allows us to then create the bioreactors that allow us to create the compounds as you move forward. Um, it's the ideal technology for neutral pharma because at, at its core, even though things like CRISPR obviously are science driven and things like AI are science driven, it is, it is uniquely capable of unlocking the potential of nature. Um, natural based, fermentation driven, cost effective, highly sustainable. It's designed to have efficacy built in and once built and once scaled, it allows you to deliver pure and consistent ingredients um, time and time again. Um, it is being used at scale as we speak in other, um, in other categories. So flavors and fragrances, as Jim mentioned, foodstuffs, um, areas like biofuel, pharma as well, have been taking advantage of it. And it's seen in the last five years alone, as you can see, a very significant amount of deal flow. Um, so now upwards of $8 billion a year flowing into synthetic, synthetic biology bets and a variety of different companies across different sectors, all basically based on synthetic biology focus. Um, one of my colleagues is also ex-Pfizer and reminded me that synthetic biology actually um, perhaps became most famous in the development of penicillin. So many people may be aware of the fact that penicillin was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928, but actually wasn't truly available on a scale basis until 1944. Um, and what happened between that period of time was we went to war and the US and UK government, um, as World War II started in earnest, put out a challenge to industry to try to find a way to take this very, very effective compound, penicillin, and see if they could do it at scale to make it available for the troops. Um, because Pfizer was already mass producing products like citric acid through deep tank fermentation, it was very familiar with the fermenting capabilities, and it brought this bear to penicillin, which really was the breakthrough that made penicillin what we know it today, which is a pretty marvelous uh, ingredient in the healthcare industry. So I liked this particular graphic because for a non-scientist it was consumable. Um, and it really sort of breaks down synthetic biology as it's modernly done. And it's, it's very much the pathway that we are following today. And in the next slide I'll, I'll drop in how we do it here at Juvenescence in combination with our friends at Chrysia to be able to make it work. Um, you're starting with a target DNA approach, and as I mentioned, more often than not, you're using CRISPR technology to then drop that DNA, snip of that DNA, into a production organism. In the case of what we're developing today, yeast, um, that then is, uh, is, is modified and then grown to be able to cr create the product that you want fermented from that. That purified product then has multiple application uses, and then there's waste. And it's a, it's a scale-up process. It's quite like making beer or making anything else through fermentation, although it feels much more painful, Patrick, when we're doing it, right? There's more, more intensity, more focus, and more gnashing of teeth as we go through, and smaller and smaller, and then bigger and bigger beakers. Um, I think of it as nature by design. Um, it's really, it's a bio-designed approach to unlock what nature has to offer in terms of efficacy. It is generative, it's not exploitive. So this is you know, some of the compounds that we will be creating using synthetic biology at Juvenescence are compounds that you would have to harvest from shark fins or uh, from wheat germ or from a variety of other sources um, and you will kick off a variety of other non-sustainable issues when you come through it, whereas this one is quite self-contained and is quite repeatable. It's really driven through a business model around metabolic engineering. And once successful, the characteristics of the output from this program is 
a higher purity, higher concentrated compound, a natural structure which will stand up to regulatory scrutiny, significantly better COGS, co cost of goods at scale, and a repeatable consistency area, exactly the type of endpoints that are critical for consumer healthcare business. If you want to get to scale and make it available to a large number of consumers, that's a critical point. How am I doing so far? Is this right pace? Everybody able to follow? Okay, feel free to scream questions. I'll leave a couple minutes at the end as well, but if I'm getting, I doubt I'm getting too obtuse, but if there are questions that you might have, feel free to interrupt. So, Patrick, I did get your picture up here, although this is pre-beard, I guess. Uh, so, um, as was mentioned by Jim, um, one of the things that attracted me to Juvenescence a few years ago when I got to meet our three founders is, um, it is not only a company of science, but it's a company of entrepreneurs. And um, part of that's because the three founders are entrepreneurs themselves and because they build a culture that's exciting to be an entrepreneur in. And one of the things that we do is we invite other entrepreneurs with great ideas to come to us, both as a source of capital, but very, very smart and hands-on capital. So we're not a portfolio investment company. We're a hands-on company that then takes advantage of relationships um, with, with our portfolio companies to build new things, to come up with new ideas. And I think um, the example of Chrysia couldn't be a better example. So um, Chrysia's CEO, uh, Pedro Pissarra, is, um, is in Portugal. Uh, Pedro has a long-standing career uh, in the antibiotic area. He sold several companies worth hundreds of millions of pounds, dollars um, in the past. Um, he was very interested um, at this point in his career and starting up something new in the synthetic biology area. Part of it's because he was a student of Professor Jens Nielsen. Um, Professor Jens Nielsen, if you don't recognize the name, is probably one of the top three to four thought leaders in the synthetic biology area. Um, his following is quite long um, and, uh, and the areas that he works in, he is one of the founders of, of um, Chrysia. So he was one of the founders that came to us. And then uh, Dr. Cohane, who um, is the chief medical officer of Chrysia. Um, you'll get a chance to meet Patrick, hopefully, during uh, cocktail hour later on. Um, Patrick's been a great colleague to work with, tremendous background, um, and uh, immunology, a variety of other areas. Patrick, I won't do you justice, I apologize. Um, but um, these three individuals with the group underneath them, um, basically came to Juvenescence a few years ago. Martin Ducker, who's since become our chief science officer and is also an Oxford graduate, um, uh, basically interrogated the technology they were looking at, interrogated the capabilities that uh, Chrysia brought to the table and the synergies with, with Juvenescence. We decided it was a great fit for, for our business so we moved forward. Um, the nice thing about the Chrysia uh, uh, partnership really is that uh, we are able to take the capabilities of Juvenescence, which, as I mentioned, is very deep on the science, and particularly on the clinical side of areas, helping to be able to determine targets to make some decisions about how to approach the clinical design of those, um, of, of demonstrating the efficacy of those targets. Also, on my business, I bring uh, a variety of different executives that come from the consumer health area and the supplement industry. Chrysia also unique capability, particularly in the synthetic biology area. We have partnerships with folks like Melton Marble, who specialize in some of the yeast fermentation area, and Rodon Biologics, which Pedro had originally founded, who are helping us with a lot of our startup fermentation work, our pilot stage work before moving it into end stage con contract managing. It's allowing us to drive to fermentation scale up. Um, as a result of this unique um, uh, collaboration, uh, we've been able to now move a initial target I'll talk about in a minute um, to be prepared to be grass approvable um, in early 2023. Um, so in two plus years short time. And we've got additional um, targets in the pipeline that we plan to be bringing into market shortly thereafter. So our first target um, is branded Sprevive, um, branded ingredient name that we own, um, Chrissy owns. Um, it is a spermidine-based product. For those of you who are aware of spermidine, spermidine is a bioactive metabolite that induces autophagy. Um, it's really focused on cellular regeneration. Um, what you may not know is although this gets a lot of press in the longevity area, 
most of the spermidine, in fact, almost all of the spermidine that's available in the market today, and almost all of the spermidine that has been used for most of the clinical studies is frankly crap. Um, it's not particularly well developed. Um, probably the leading competitor located out of Germany, um, if you look at their benchmark, and these guys are considered best in class right now in the market, it's a wheat germ extract product. Its purity level is less than 1%. Um, the, the level required for a 20 milligram dose would be equivalent of about 20 pills a day to be able to get to that level of dosing. It means that you can only um, harvest that kind of wheat germ extract one to two times a year. So it's not particularly sustainable and it's very expensive to the market. Contrast that with the Spreviv product that we're in the process of scaling up using precision fermentation. We expect to be able to achieve 98% plus level of, of potency in the market. Servings, therefore, will only be about one pill, two pills possibly a day to get to an efficacious dosage level. Um, continual harvesting, 100 plus a year, um, since we're using uh, specialized fermentation to be able to bring it forward and a significant, therefore, decrease in cost, which means that both for a supplement standalone product, but also as an ingredient in cosmetics, in hair regrowth, in a variety of different both internal and external products, this would be a perfect product to be able to introduce into more um, uh, premium-based uh, brands uh, around the world, frankly. Um, the technology, this is where I will have to very closely consult my notes. Um, so this is a, um, this, this entire area um, of polyamines is an outgrowth from a lot of the work that uh, Jens has done for over 10 years. Um, he's been sort of a pioneer in this area for 10 plus years, particularly developing these platforms. And really there's four patent families that sit behind this one particular uh, area. Um, it's set up, as you see in the upper right hand side, to um, genetically engineer yeast to allow those yeast to overproduce um, in areas of amino acid uh, ornithinine, um, which then begets additional opportunities to bridge this into a polyamine area. Um, we're currently focusing, as I mentioned, on spermidine, but we can also use the same basic technology, the same basic patent estate to go after putrescine or spermine um, ingredients as appropriate moving forward. Um, and then the background strain actually would allow it to work as kind of a mother strain across a variety of other future analogs that you can see in the bottom right hand area. So what's exciting about each one of these development areas in synthetic biology is you're not just targeting one product that you're bringing to market, you're actually developing platform technology. As, as spermidine comes through, it'll enable us to then rapidly grow additional products in the pipeline as you move forward. Um, we're very, very excited about the speed with which we've been able to move forward in this area. Again, taking advantage fully of the patent estate that uh, has been brought to us through our um, investment and, uh, and really founding position in Chrysia. Spermidine has been studied quite a bit. As I mentioned, um, some of these studies, um, uh, we should look with a bit askance only because the quality of the spermidine used in them is not the same quality that we would be bringing to market. Um, but what you can see is that preclinical models show that it's protective in a wide array of disease models ranging from cardio to hair loss. Um, it's a, also showed to be um, an evolutionary conserved method to extend uh, lifespan across a variety of different model organisms. The human data, frankly, is somewhat sparse because of you know, poor quality um, candidates going through. Um, part of that is because that there's been limitations of this supply. Um, with 1% uh, potency wheat germ extracts available when we believe ultimately that you need probably 10 to 20 times that level to get to an efficacious doses level. There is exciting early evidence that you can see here um, where large epidemiological studies with patients in low, medium, and high have been found with high spermidine intake to reduce risks of cardiovascular disease, cognitive impairment, and all-cause mortality. Um, what's more important, frankly, than all of these studies is the fact that under Patrick's leadership, we're already putting our first study, we have our first study in the market today uh, to be able to look at the 
um, variety of different indications, the mechanisms of action, and the potential for this to be a leading geroprotector for years to come. And we'll have a report out on that study, we hope later this year, if all goes well. I mentioned the fact that in the synthetic biology area, um, the spermidine opportunity is not the only one that we are going after. Um, we are also looking at opportunities to build a platform around ergothionine. Um, we have some strong interest in the flavonoid area um, and an area that we're calling longevity lipids here, um, which probably of all of these is potentially the biggest opportunity in that it targets cognition opportunities and it has a very strong application in the infant formula area. Um, there's a bunch of other areas that we're working on the discovery phase. Um, we hope to muscle up, frankly, our Chrysia relationship um, through M&A to be able to add some additional assets to what already is a very strong early stage pilot capability um, so that uh, we can then become a true leader in the space as we move forward. And as we think about investments for Juvenescence, we hope that this is going to be a major target area for the future. <laughs>